Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be able to show here some slides about our paper, Explore, Engage, Interact, Reflectance, Transformation, Imaging in the Web. We are a small group working at Digital Humanities Lab of the University of Basel. We are uh, originally a group which came from the Department of Physical Chemistry focusing very much on scientific photography and as you can imagine with the years it was somehow clear that there is a fundamental change in photography and this fundamental change was certainly not only but drastically introduced with this technological change um, being a machine which uses a silicon chip to be sensitive for light and here you see one of the early prototypes of Kodak the big company which made analog film and this early prototype is upcycled or recycled technology it's a slide projector um, as a camera body it has a standard lens of course and what you see is some electronics below it on, on the right you see data carrier the data storage device it's uh, actually uh, audio tape and Steve Sassen has been working in Kodak as technology, um, let's say, um, in, in the field of technology exploration. And he realized quite early that there will happen something with imaging devices, which consequences were not even um, potentially um, estimatable. What happened? It happened quite a lot. Um, the analog photography and um, the number of images taken on analog film uh, decreased suddenly in about the year 2005. And the whole number of images, especially the number of digital images, increased also dramatically and this process didn't stop up to now. This also had, of course, consequences for our research group. And our research group, the scientific lab um, for photography, or the, the, the lab for scientific photography, um, being part of the physical chemistry department of the University of Basel, had to look for a new home. And this change, actually, was and this 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 decrease of analog film material just to give you some side information about that um, effect happened actually because of the fact that motion picture has exactly the same um, physical material as standard still photography uses and the big majors of the film companies they wanted to become completely filmless the only obstacle were the theatres, because the theatres um, had this long-lasting infrastructure, the projecting machines and all this, to, um, which lasts for a couple of years, even um, decades. And there was a quite a smart movement um, to force the theatres to become fully digital by this movie. Avatar, you remember? It was one of the movies which was shown in 3D. And if a theater wanted to become in 3D um, and being able to demo, to show Avatar, they had to become a digital theater. And as you can imagine, uh, a blockbuster, it's about 500 um, theaters alone, only in the United States. A blockbuster means that those 500 theaters have to show a film at the same evening. One hour of film is about 1.5 miles of film material, so it's quite a number. And so with this drastic change that uh, motion picture became filmless, this forced also still photography to become somehow, from a technical point of view, obsolete, and it forced the transition into the digital domain. Interesting is here that um, actually, the, the analog film, as we see it here in the left, is quite a binary thing. It has grain or no grain if we stay with a black and white material. If light um, penetrates the, the silver halide film, um, it reacts and, and uh, exposes, actually, 
the silver highlights so that there is a, a certain develop um, a certain area which can be developed um, the crystals that can be developed they generate then black grain and it's interesting to know that the analog film really has a binary behavior there is either grain or no grain whereas uh, electronic chip and i have written here electronic not equal to digital makes a very proportional electrical signal um, to the man, amount of light which comes in so it is a purely analog device so the transition was not from analog to digital but actually it was from the binary world to a completely analog world which is quite interesting for the group of the scientific um, photography lab it meant that we had to digitize quite a number of um, uh, obsolete analog film materials because they do not last forever as some people always think analog film decays very fast early film um, shows effects like um, the, the vinegar acid vinegar syndrome and so it's really uh, in, in, in a need to digitize such early films so that we can preserve the information which is stored on it it's actually an information carrier um, also on the right you see that the carrier shrunk so that the um, silver highlight film on top coated on top um, makes those wrinkle, wrinkles and actually the film cannot be used like this anymore so also our group had to move from the science faculty to the humanities faculty and we were renamed into digital humanities lab and as you can imagine it was quite a culture shock but it for us it was quite interesting to see the new applications um, potentially um, forming technology so technologies um, really develop technology so that it follows a certain um, application from the humanities research was highly interesting and we have three pillars where we work in one is still the the uh, photography topic creation imaging scanning um, of of originals and if we scan something and of course it makes sense to preserve this new kind of digital original so archiving became more and more important it's still something we are very much interested in and if we preserve something then it certainly makes sense also to make um, functional use functional use of those elements which we stored and so one imaging technology which is quite interesting in this context is certainly RTI reflectance transformation imaging and if we look back at um, photography it has one drawback it has many many advantages it is a very authentic way and reproducible way of um, creating um, a reproduction of an original um, but it has the drawback that it is very static photography is static in the means that you have to take a capture of something which um, the future application then is bound to to the to the reproduction you just created to give you an example we have twice the same painting on the left side you see a painting which is illuminated as it is being done um, usually um, for reproductional purposes two or four light sources each positioned with a 45 degree incoming light angle creates an image which has nearly no shadows we don't see the topography of the oil paint on the right side we have a very flat angle one single light coming in and there you see very clearly that we have a lot of topography in this painting we see even brush strokes but of course the image itself um yeah looks somehow distorted so we we can take both of those images but we have to decide in the moment of capture so with rti we have the possibility to actually capture a number of photographs actually 48 and with those 48 um, images which you can see here a set of we can we can actually recreate um, a surface model which is much beyond just the n photographs we just captured what is being done the 48 images each captured from the same position of the camera but each illuminated differently are stacked on each other 
And for each pixel position, which shows the same point of the, of the painting, but illuminated differently, um, we, we analyze the brightness and um, we can fit a mathematical model into those data points so that we can actually recreate the surface light interaction in such a way that we bring in the physics. And the physics, you see it here, it's a, it's a, it's a model, the blue mathematical model which is fit in is the model of a very diffuse scattering surface. We call this also a Lambertian reflector. And this Lambertian reflector has the, can be very well um, um, described with such a second order polynom. And you also see we have very little error between the red measured points and the blue mathematical model. And so we do this process for each and every pixel position. It's actually a technology um, about 20 years ago um, invented by the Hewlett Packard Labs and a guy there called Maltzbender. And um, what allows us this is to actually be able to <clears throat> re-illuminate an original in such a way that you really can have a photographic um, quality of image, super high resolution, um, nearly non-distortion, so even from its geometry, um, very little interpolational artifacts, actually none if we stay with a, with a, with a true resolution image, but we can re re-illuminate the thing as you would move a torch around this object. The same can be done here. We, have, we developed a, a further um, stage of evolution of RTI where we can separate different materials from each other. You see the blue dress is very matte. It's close to a Lambertian reflector, whereas the gold is actually um, glossy. And so you see there very well um, this effect of, of very specific um, light. You, I show this to you again. If you look now, I tried. Now you see, you see the gold is very behaving different than the blue. So that's nice. Even the eyebrows also the, behave different. That's nice. And so that's a nice technology. But as I said um, in, in one of the slides before, um, of course, we need to make functional use of something like this. And functional use is not only something which is for researchers important, it's also a thing which is important as a general trend in the digital domain of research and science. Um, we have very different um, things like fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data. We, if we hand in a project proposal, we have to deliver also a data management plan, a DMP. And of course, data must be open access so that people can make reuse of such research information and, and, and find and access it and make it operable as fair data. And now this um, open access and, and DMP requests is rather more something uh, of a demand, a political demand from funding agency than a solution which, which was existing when these uh, different kinds of demands were actual. One of the answers, it's actually starting from the next year on, is a Swiss national solution which is called DASH, the Data and Service Center for the Humanities which was in a pilot phase funded by the Swiss Academy of Humanities and Social Sciences. And now it's actually passing over to um, funding, long-term infrastructure funding from um, the SNF, the Swiss um, Science Foundation. So we have, there are existing infrastructures which, which actually are highly interesting um, to, to be used as um, big repositories which give open access um, to, to data, which allow um, finding and accessing information to make it interoperable and reusable. But actually what is interesting is that uh, such a, we, we have now seen that we have technology on one hand, we have infrastructures on the other. Need is something like storytelling. In many cases, it is very important to give somehow a red line through this big C 
and of information and data. Of course, for researchers, this is not that important. But if we speak about open data and fair data, we need to have actually um, more information about the assets, assets that are stored. We need information about the collections. We also need very um, comprehensive metadata, which allows us to store information not only of technical nature about the original and not only about um, the objects themselves, also about the context. So we need also the digital infrastructure, as I have shown with the example of Dash. And if we have all those three elements, we are able to do something which I would like to call curation in the digital 2.0. Digital curation, as we know it from archiving, means basically OAIS, bitstream preservation, migration strategy, do not touch the content. If we look at the conventional wording of, of uh, curation, it, from the collection point of view, it means something completely different. Of course, it means also preservation of the originals, but it means also in-depth cataloging and indexing and thinking about collections, thinking about content and create something new out of that. And this was a challenge which we tried in uh, different projects to, to demonstrate the strength of data, meta information and high-end imaging to make very attractive new ways of uh, uh, information presentation in the context of cultural heritage. We have here um, the Münster shots. It's part of the Basel Münster um, jewelry collection. It's actually, um, uh, there are different objects. I don't know even how many about uh, more than 100 in total, but a set of the objects we digitized in this, in this pilot project with a high resolution camera, 150 megapixels with RTI. And what we tried is to demonstrate very strongly the importance of this bringing together high-end imaging technologies with comprehensive contextual metadata. You see this here, we have on the right side, and you can go to munstershots.ch to actually do this live demo. It's all online and uh, very nice to browse around. We have on the left side the high resolution imaging image. You can zoom in. Um, you can actually read, in some cases, limited meta information as here, but in other cases, much more comprehensive metadata. And you have um, a, a, um, a content, uh, ex excuse me, um, a context to other objects which are in relation to this one. But what we also did is we tried to animate certain things with this RTI approach. Unfortunately, here it's not a movie, but you can imagine and you can try it out by yourself so that things in the metadata which are pointed out, like here the silver border is noticeably scratched and scratched is red. If you click on it, the image will actually bring the incoming light in such a, a position that you can see the scratches and it will zoom to this position so that you immediately see what is being made. Of course, this is nice, but it needs um, different approaches with our, which are not um, just yet standard. We have to think about an appropriate ontology to be able to store all these different um, new things, like the ad advanced technical meta information to um, describe a certain scene setting with incoming light, camera position, and so on. But we also need a, a very high uh, or going beyond standards um, as we see them today, metadata schema, which allows us to really bring in this contextualization, which we believe is very important. The whole setup then allows us to really make a reuse of research data in a much broader um, way for education, for teaching, 
for cultural heritage um, um, communication. And we believe that this is a big potential to think about curation, think about the curation in a new way, what it can mean in the digital domain, and really bring it together with infrastructures, with new um, advanced metadata schemas and high-end imaging. I'm very happy to um, respond to questions and thank you very much for your attention.